Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us as part of the, our Meet the Scientist series. My name is Reed Corbett. I'm the Dean of Integrated Coastal Programs and the Executive Director here at the Coastal Studies Institute. I hope you're safe, healthy, as we work through these challenging times. We at CSI have always made every effort to engage our community through many different, often in-person programs, like our Science on the Sound, the annual open house, and, and the dozens of K-12 programs that we offer every year. But like you, we've had to pivot. We've pivoted to more virtual world given our current situation. Our Meet the Scientist series is one of several ways we hope to continue to bring you some of the exciting science being conducted here at CSI. We encourage you to browse our updated website, learn about other ways you can engage with us including a new virtual campus tour on the website. You'll see it there. So I want to thank John McCord behind the scenes and his great group, including Parker and Dave, for helping make all of this possible. Since I have your attention, before we get started, I also want to let you know that CSI continues to grow. We have several new scientists on campus, just recently welcomed 18 undergraduate and graduate students to our campus for the full spring semester. In fact, I hope many of them are watching tonight, especially since we have one of their faculty in the hot seat. As we continue to grow our curriculum opportunities here on the Outer Banks for students attending ECU or one of the other UNC institutions, we need to provide scholarships to help these students pay for the housing and other academic expenses while they're here on the coast. In that vein, I have initiated an ECU Coastal Scholarship that is focused on providing financial support to students while they spend a full semester at ECU's Outer Banks campus. Please consider growing this scholarship so we can bring more students, increase the number of students spending their full semester or maybe a whole academic year on our coast. So again, thank you for listening and considering how you can support the Coastal Studies Institute. All right, now to the main event. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce a great friend, a longtime colleague, Dr. Mike Mulia. Dr. Mulia, thank you for your willingness to sit in the hot seat for this session tonight. Thanks, Reed. So, I don't want you to let Mike's good looks, his <laughs> surfer demeanor to fool you. Dr. Mulia is one of our top performers, our top scientists here at CSI. One thing is certain, Mike breaks the scientist stereotype. The typical lab coat, pocket protector, calculator, and glasses. In fact, that is part of what this programming is all about. Breaking some of the typical stereotypes and getting to know some of our scientists. So let's get right into it. All right, Mike, so you are one of the longest serving, actually probably now the longest serving employee at CSI. I think you came aboard in 2004. Three. 2003, so since the very beginning. You have seen the organization grow, you've seen it change, and, and when I sort of look over those years, I see very similar parallels with your own career, academic career and otherwise. You know, to include your PhD at Chapel Hill. And so just to start, you know, tell us a little bit about this path, your background and, and you know, how you got to CSI, your interest in oceanography, right? Let's start there, is that path you took from oceanography to CSI to where you are today. All right, so um, yeah, I think I have had a, a rather atypical route to where I am now, right? Um, I started in marine biology at the University of Miami just because I was an ocean nut, not because I necessarily had a pa an academic passion for marine biology. I found it interesting. And, um, and like any other good biology or bad biology student, right? <laughs> I put off my physics requirements as long as I could. Mm -hmm. And it was the second semester of physics that I was taking. We had some time to talk about special relativity and I was just floored by that. So I went to my, my advisor at the time it was Dr. Linda Farmer, and I said, I want to change, change my major to physics. She said, well, you're a junior, you know, I don't think that's wise, but, you know, <laughs> a little late, a yeah. little late. <clears throat> if you're interested, maybe you can take a modern physics class, you'll be in there with 
physics majors and, and engineers. And if you can swim with them and you still think it's interesting, well, maybe you're onto something. So I did that and I, um, and I was just blown away. I couldn't sleep. I spent a lot of time just thinking about, rethinking about um, being a scientist and what it actually meant. Some of the modern physics ideas like relativity and quantum mechanics just kind of blew me away. And I thought, you know, I felt like we had grown up thinking linearly and that wasn't the right way to go as a scientist, that things were cyclic. And so I was retraining myself to think like that. So I went back and I got a physics degree at UNC Wilmington. I have a great friend there, uh, Russell Herman, who's a mathematical physics professor. He taught a class on nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. It also blew me away. Um, that's ubiquitous in nature, so that was something else I wanted to pursue. And then I went to graduate school at Chapel Hill for physics and was trying to figure out how I would bring my love of the ocean. Yeah, I was saying, wait, wait, you're an oceanographer. Where, what in the world? How was I going to do physics <laughs> research and be away from the ocean, right? So. Um, I started studying physical oceanography with Dr. Harvey Syme, and, and the rest is history. And so I worked with, with Harvey for, for about a year after I got my master's in physics there. I didn't do a PhD because I was kind of losing my mind being away from the ocean. And I said, I love working with you, but I'm looking for other jobs at the coast because I've had enough living up here. And um, he came back to me, and he was doing pretty well at the time and said, you know, how would you like to... Uh, go help start a research institute in the Outer Banks. And I was like, wow, that's dream job, right? So, and so you had already had an affiliation with the Outer Banks. Yeah, I was already down here doing a lot of ocean observing work already. We're setting up a radar network to measure ocean surface currents, which maybe we'll talk about later. But So I was coming down here anyways, commuting, and just staying down here in hotels. And he said, hey, why don't you do that and help this thing get off, off the ground? And so that was a huge adventure to start. I mean, it was just Nancy White, our founding director, and I, and, and we had um, some space that Dare County was gracious enough to give us, and a lot of folks from um, the higher education task force that were supportive in getting us here. We, we basically started with a phone line internet connection and an old moldy house that is no longer there, so right. that was fun. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the <coughs> circuitous routes we often take to find ultimately what we love, and, you know, I think in oceanography, the idea that it is so interdisciplinary, but yet many of us um, that are oceanographers have this disciplinary grounding. And so, you know, I'm curious, you know, with your, your physics degree, certainly your marine biology degree, you know, that grounding in physics, do you think that's what drove, I mean, you know, sort of combining oceanography with physics, um, you know, that, that love there? I mean, was it the ocean that drew you to it, or was it that interest in physics and what you could apply it to? I think it was a bit of both, right? I, I, I love to work on the ocean, and, and as we'll talk about in a little while, I, I work on the Gulf Stream, which is a big nonlinear system, right? And, and so that's very interesting from a physics perspective. All right, so let's maybe get into that, the idea that the Gulf Stream is nonlinear. So what do you mean, right? So the Gulf Stream is certainly dynamic, and maybe give a little bit about that background, the idea that it's nonlinear, the importance of the Gulf Stream sitting off of our coast. Well, yeah, the Gulf Stream, I mean, we could back up even a little bit more on that. Sure. Yeah, the Gulf Stream is, is, a, is a pretty special place, especially for our research group. And um, so we work out there all the time. And it's, as John's showing a picture right now, uh, the, the, the big gradients between the ocean temperature and the atmosphere, especially in the winter, are extreme. And the picture that he's showing, he's showing some sea smoke, right? That's because this, the, the water is very, very warm. It's like 76, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And in this case, maybe the, the air temperature is 40 degrees. And so you have all this heat flux going on. And the amazing thing when you're out there is that the Gulf Stream really makes its own weather. And so you and I were just, 60 miles offshore recently and we experienced this where we're inshore and it's fairly calm it's a beautiful day and we hit the gulf stream and it's just rough as hell right so um and it's just an amazing place it's it's hard to communicate without being out there how miraculous it is and so just seeing that it seems like it's an exception that i that i go out there to work and don't see something that's astounding right uh the currents are four to six knots in what we call the jet, the main flow of the stream, and especially in the wintertime, the temperature gradients are very extreme between, as I mentioned, so. Although but for somebody that doesn't study the ocean, the idea of four to six knots, right, doesn't seem like much at all, right? I mean, my, 
you know, my, my son could do that on a skateboard. Yeah, so that's, that's an incredibly fast ocean current. One way um, that one of the, ocean, the boat captains that I was working with put it to me is like, every knot of current is like 10 knots of wind to try to work a boat. So this is like trying to maneuver a vessel in 40 knots of wind when you're out there. Yeah. Right? Well, and the significance of the Gulf Stream, right? The size of the Gulf Stream, the size of that current. Right? Yeah, the amount of water, you know, the, the, the current flowing through, uh, through the Florida Straits is about, is about 30 sphere drips. So that means in scientific terms, like 30 million cubic meters of water per second. Again. Right. You get up here <laughs> and estimates are like between 50 and depending where you are off of Hatteras, 50 and, and 90 sphere drips when you get further offshore. And what does that mean? It's like, I, I want a trillion dollars. Like, I don't get that. Right. So just to put that into perspective, it's like off of Hatteras, it's like 30 times the flow of all the rivers on Earth combined. Right, not just past. one river, but all, all of, them. of them Yeah, combined. so think about major, your Ganges and Amazon, all these, put them all together and they're just a drop in the bucket compared to what's flowing off of Cape Hatteras. So that's yeah. why it is such a dynamic system, right? And yeah, and it sort of brings influence. your understanding of the physics and the importance of understanding that. I mean, I think of the Gulf Stream and think about all the heat that you just talked about that is sitting right off our coast and the importance of that current and climate on global scales. Yeah. Right? So understanding that system is pretty critical. Absolutely. And we're talking about global warming and what's happening with global warming. And, and the Gulf Stream is basically transporting all this heat from the tropics to the north. And, and so... That's why, um, well, that's one reason that, that the weather is the way that it is, right? right. So if that system sure. changes, it could change our weather incredibly. And so you mentioned the Gulf Stream is a pretty dynamic system. And in fact, a lot of your PhD focused on looking at these dynamics of the Gulf Stream. And your research over the last many years is not exclusively, but certainly has focused on the Gulf Stream um, significantly. And so... I'm, I'm curious if you, know, if, if you want to think about the Gulf Stream and all of these dif different aspects of it, the dynamics, the importance, some of the things that you've studied, H how is it you go about studying a system like this, studying a current of that magnitude? So there are many ways, right, to do it. And, and, and my group uh, specializes in making observations or measurements. And so we use different instruments to do that. And right now we have an instrument on the bottom uh, on what's called a shelf slope where we go from the shelf to the deep ocean in about seven, eight hundred feet of water. It's been sitting there for several months and it's measuring currents over nearly the entire water column. John's showing a picture of one of these on the bottom right now. And it's also, also measuring the salinity and temperature at, at the pod that he's showing. And, and the salinity and temperature for us is like a proxy for what water mass is over that pod. So is it the Gulf Stream? Is it the Mid-Atlantic Bight water on our shelf? Is it the South Atlantic Bight water? And so um, that's one way that we measure. We also have a, net, a network of land-based uh, coastal ocean radars that measure the ocean surface current. And they're really special because we can look at how the Gulf Stream varies with high frequency. So what does that mean? Like every hour I can see where the edge of the Gulf Stream is when the radar network is up. Um, and that's important because the research that we do is not only looking at the Gulf Stream, but how the Gulf Stream affects the currents on the shelf and, and all the other parts of the physics that's going on. Right, and so you mentioned a couple different water masses, right? The idea that, you know, you look out there, it's one, it's the Atlantic, right? But you just mentioned three different water masses, and so maybe Yeah, the special thing bit. about Cape Hatteras, and I always say this silly thing that people are probably sick of hearing me say, is it's like the Mason-Dixon line for oceanography on the east coast of the United States. So north of Cape Hatteras on the shelf, the water tends to be, um, the mid-Atlantic bite water tends to be uh, relatively fresh and cold. And, and so that's the mid-Atlantic bite cold pool, they call it. And south of Cape Hatteras, uh, is, is the water is warm and, and salty, and on average it's flowing to the north. And these two water masses meet on the shelf in what's called the Hatteras Front. And that front gets pushed around north and south based on wind forcing, and we think based on wiggling of the Gulf Stream. And as surfers and, and fishermen around here, we all know that well. We know how the water temperature changes so quickly with the passage of a front like we had today in, in Buxton or down in Frisco. And so, um, you know, people, people like to, to understand that. You sure. Know, so it's fun. So let's, let's clarify something. And so oftentimes 
you just mentioned how water temperatures can vary so much and so quickly on the Outer Banks. And you, you'll often hear people say, well, you know, it just got warmer because the Gulf Stream moved in. Let's, let's dispel. All right, all right. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not untrue to say that, that, that Gulf Stream water, you know, doesn't make its way up on the shelf and mix with those different water masses and influence the salinity and temperature at the coast. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that varies our water temperature here is the movement of the Hatteras front. So we get that South Atlantic bite water moved up to Nags Head, it gets warm. Or then the wind switches out of the north and it pushes it down around Frisco and, and everything cools off abruptly, like 10 degrees Fahrenheit right. or something, right? That's mainly what's going on, but the Gulf Stream water mix is in there too. Um, I think one, one thing that we often hear is that the Labrador current comes down here and right at Hatteras it hits the Gulf Stream. Well, that's not, like the Labrador current is up in the Labrador Sea. And certainly some of that water makes its way down here, but it's not the current itself that's ramming into the Gulf Stream. But some of that water actually passes beneath the Gulf Stream in the upper limb of the deep western boundary current that also uh, intersects the Gulf Stream off of Hatteras, which as you go deep is another reason why we live in such a neat place. Yeah, so I mean, talk about dynamics, right? I mean, so that, again, I think that is... I mean, clearly you're passionate about it. I think because it's so dynamic, because you have all of these different currents and the physics associated with that, it's a real draw for somebody like you with your background. Um, what's interesting is you, you sort of spoke to um, the strength of the Gulf Stream, the amount of water that's moving through the Gulf Stream. And, you know, as, as part, you know, you've been a, a player in uh, the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program, which is supported here at CSI with multiple partners across the UNC system. And you currently sit as the Assistant Director for Research. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you could sort of talk about sort of your role of in, within this program um, and how that might relate to the Gulf Stream. Sure. So um, like CSI, our Renewable Ocean Energy Program has, has gone through a lot of changes in the last about 10 years that we've had it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the changes have been um, some, something that's very good for us. Um, initially, when marine hydrokinetic energy was being looked at nationwide, it was being looked at for what we call grid scale energy. So what that means is, where can I tap into ocean energy and power all the homes, say, in North Carolina? Um, and more recently, in the last five years or so, that tact has changed a little bit to more niche applications. And what do I mean by that? So if I go to a, a place where I need to power an instrument or, or something like that, like taking baby steps, trying to get some energy um, on a small scale for certain smaller applications before we try to jump and power the entire United States with wave energy. And, sure. and in our case, when we started looking at energy on a grid scale, the only grid scale resource we thought we had for North Carolina was from the Gulf Stream because this immense energy is out there. So we started trying to understand, well, where's the optimal location for getting energy from the Gulf Stream? And that's where my group started making these measurements. So since then, um, as we move more to niche applications, um, what my group does is work with several engineering colleagues in the engineering schools around the state, um, UNC Charlotte, NC State, trying to develop some of these ways to get energy from the Gulf Stream. So for example, we have a project with Chris Vermillion's group and NC State to develop an underwater kite that harvests energy. And there, is, there are wind kites that do this, we're doing it in the water. And so um, to do that, obviously you need to inform the engineering community about the ocean conditions, which is what we do. We make these measurements say, well, the ocean doesn't just flow nice and neat like this. The Gulf Stream is a nonlinear system. It's difficult to predict. It moves around. There's lots of shearing. All these are things that you need to consider when you're designing something to harvest energy from it. So that's kind of what another aspect of, of the research that my group works on. And so, yeah, think about, I, I sort of think about all of the different research that's being done within the Ocean Energy Program. And, and clearly, understanding the observations are, are critical. Um, another aspect is you know, just understanding the resource wholly, right? I mean, understanding what could potentially be tapped. And, and I, re I understand that your work is probably a significant um, contributed to understanding, but modeling must be also modeling is a huge is a huge um, component of that research, right? Because we can't measure everything all over the place, and we have um, like Roy Ying He's group at NC State does a nice job of giving us a regional model 
that allows us to estimate the wave energy and the current energy and the movement of the Gulf Stream all over the, the whole region. And so we work very closely with his group to, to um, compare the observations to his model. He start, uh, started to assimilate our observations into his model to make the modeling better, right? And also, you can, you can judge the skill of the model from making comparisons with the observations. So we also, we may, we also do wave work, too. We're trying to understand the wave field here, not just the Gulf Stream. But, um, yeah. So, yeah, so waves are a potential source of energy. I mean, I think early on, the Ocean Energy Program was focused a lot on trying to understand what that wave energy, that renewable energy source might be. And more recently, um, I think you know, you've been involved as well as other, others within the Ocean Energy Program have, have been involved in um, the Waves to Water Prize. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to highlight that because I think it's something our community should know about um, and the opportunity they'll have to, to get involved. And so I wonder if you could just speak to the Waves to Water Prize and, and the Renewable Ocean Energy Program's role in that. Sure, the Waves to Water Prize is, is a, a really exciting competition that's being hosted by DOE and, and eventually by CSI and, and our colleagues here. Um, the, the prize competition is open to competitors from academia, from the engineering community, or from private industry to develop uh, a wave-powered desalination system. And so what we're doing is working with that team. Um, our team at CSI is working with the team at the National Renewable Energy Labs in the Department of Energy to um, eventually bring those competitors here to the Outer Banks so that they can test these desalination wave energy desalination devices that they've made at Jeanette's Pier. And so a large component of that, that is not just the physically, physical implementation of doing that testing, but also what are the environmental considerations so we can do that responsibly, right? What is the resource at Jeanette's Pier? How can we get our students involved in the, in the project that we're doing there? And they can learn from that and from the, the other marine energy community folks that are participating, bringing that all together so that in 2022, April 2022, we'll have this competition at Jeanette's Pier. We'll bring these competitors here the public will get to see what we're working on and we'll put these devices in and for about five days we'll we'll test them yeah so that, that's interesting <clears throat> the idea that you know there's waves there's currents i mean you are an observationalist right i mean you study the ocean through direct observations and the instruments that you put out there you know how hard could it be i mean you drop instruments in the water they sit out there for, i mean you just said they sit out there for a few months you retrieve them piece of cake i mean where is the expertise needed here? Right, yeah. I mean, anyone that works on the ocean knows it's just <laughs> an incredibly challenging place to work. Yeah, so I if mean, you've speak, ever tried to yeah, keep a boat to going. Bit, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, just <laughs> keeping your outboard running. Yeah, keeping your outboard running. But speak to that a little running. bit about, you know, sort of the, the challenges. I mean, and, and that's not necessarily negative, right? I mean, that challenge is part of what drives us. Um, but, yeah, the challenges of, of monitoring, of, of observing <laughs> with some of the tools that you use in the ocean. It's just very difficult when you put electronics in the ocean and you're trying to keep them around. You know, I remember when I was a kid and you know, I grew up in the water and I remember cleaning the boat with my dad and my dad asking me to do all these things to fix the boat and thinking to myself, man, when I get older, I'm not gonna do any of this. And this <laughs> stuff is the most impossible stuff that he's asking me. And here I am like doing it, right? So, That's you know, it's funny because I used to make mud patties as a kid, a little different. <laughs> And somehow I study. <laughs> <laughs> somehow now you study I the mud, mud which I in the ocean. You about all the time. So yeah, maybe what we do as a kid really does align with where we're going to be as, in the future. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no. But that's the funny thing. It's like that. Cha it's just so difficult to make things work. And I, you know, I we're lucky that we have good partners, right? I, I've made fr really great friends with the fishing community down here. I've learned so much from from people that have spent their lives on the water. They know so much more than I do about what's going on here, right? So that's, the, that's where you go to start. Like, how do you do this? How does this work? And, and they know better than I do how tricky it is to do things on the ocean, right? But, yeah. Um, I, mean, I think it's interesting the number of partnerships that you have made. Um, and, and CSI is very interested in creating these. And you've done an incredible job of of bringing people from all sorts of walks of life, not just academics, to bring them into your science and, and into what CSI is doing. And I, I wonder if you might speak to just you know, that idea of the partnerships and 
you know, where you see is those being important, how that can help you in your own science? Well, um, yeah, certainly, I, again, I, I kind of stand on other people's shoulders to do what I do. I, I started early on working with, um, with Reed Meredith down here, who would help me get some equipment offshore when I didn't have a boat or a truck or anything. I started working with the field research facility folks. I learned a ton from Kent Hathaway um, and the folks at the field research facility about how to do things in, in the water. Um, I have a friend who runs the Tiki up in, in Ocean City, Maryland, um, Stormy Harrington, who actually did all the work on our research boat, which was unique, right? I said to him, how can we cut these big holes and put these instruments in here? And he had to craft it himself. Yeah, who, and who wants to cut big holes in a boat? <laughs> Perfectly good vessel. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I mean, and this is somebody who's lived their entire life on the water, right? And done everything you can think of. And so when I'm trying to figure out how to do something, these are the people that I go ask, the people that know so much more than I do. Like, how do you do this? You know, what would you do? And, I, and I've actually brought people like that into my proposals as consultants because it's like, let's, let's, let's bring in somebody that really has the know-how, not somebody with an academic degree. But, right. you know. but I think also your ability to work with so many different people is, is one of the reasons you get brought into so many proposals as well. I mean, you're getting pulled in a lot of different directions, right? And so you're, you're now an assistant scientist here within CSI and part of the D Department of Coastal Studies. And so you're seeing, I think, the science maybe, or this profession from a different lens, maybe. I'm curious <laughs> to see, again, that transition. Yeah, you've that been transition. part of this for a while. And so now you're, now you're, you're not just <laughs> going out and putting out <laughs> instruments. You're leading some of this science. And, and what do you, you know, how, how, how do you, Say something about that, sort of that growth, right? I would see yeah. that as growth, but you might see it as something right. else. Right. So I've gone from working out in the ocean to staring at my computer. Oh, that's come, not, on, no, man, no. come on. That, I'm just kidding. It's fun to lead the projects because that's where you can, you can come up with your own creative ideas and, and try to, after you've done all this for a while, you know the people to go to to ask for help, and you put that team together. And I mean... Really, that's what I value. It's the people that I value the most. When you put a team together like that, like the people that work with me here at CSI are, are the most important aspect of my research, right? They do, they make it happen. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you have these creative ideas and you're trying to do some of these nearly impossible things and you put these teams together and that's, that's really gratifying, right? Yeah. I enjoy that. All right, I, I want to ask you one more question from my point of view and then we'll get to some of the questions from the audience. And so if you, if you do have questions, please go ahead and type those in so we can ask Mike. Again, he's in the hot seat. He doesn't know they're coming. So please type in your questions. So we might have undergrads. We might have, you know, middle school or high school students watching. And so, you know, from your perspective, you know, what do you think about, you know, if you are interested in the ocean, whether it's the physics or, or just oceanography generally? I mean, how... Well, Something I try to convey to my students and when, when I'm teaching and at the end of the semester and to kids in general um, is that, you know, I, I'm kind of an idealist. So I love the ocean. I love working on the ocean. I tell the kids that I'm teaching, you should do what you love, right? And don't go chase the money or something like that. But then the money just follows because you happen to be good at what you're doing because you love it. So when I first moved down here, you know, I remember having conversations with Harvey when I talked to him on the phone and just be like, this is ridiculous. He's like, How's, how are things going down there? It's ridiculous. Like, I want to pinch myself. I live in the Outer Banks. So I'm <laughs> diving and working on the water. It's fantastic. That's how you want to feel. Like, you don't go to work. You're doing something that you love to do, right? And that's, that's exceptional, I think. And just believing that you can do that. Like, you can almost just dream what you want to do and go do it. I try to convey that to my students as best I can, I guess. Yeah. And so... If somebody wanted to be an oceanographer, would you steer them in a particular direction? Yeah, I would steer them in the direction that, you know, what is it that you're passionate about? What are you interested in in the ocean? And, you know, I remember in marine science at, at, uh, at Miami, this saying was like, you know, you're a marine science major. Have fun waiting tables, right? <laughs> and I just feel like I just didn't even listen to that. Like, I don't care what you have to say. I'm not doing that. Yeah. And so... Um, not that there's anything wrong with waiting tables, but I wanted to be a marine scientist, right? right. So, um, so yeah, I would just tell them like, what what interests you about the ocean, and go learn about it. Yeah. Go do that. Yeah, the opportunities are endless. Yeah. from engineering to, you know, outreach K through twelve. Right. Anyway, it's you it's could, endless. You, you could be an ocean educator. Like we have a great ocean educator here. 
Terry right. Kirby Hathaway, you could do that if you like to teach. Or you could be an engineer, an ocean engineer. Or, and there's a million things you right. could do, but do what you love to do. Yeah, good. I think that's great advice, <clears throat> regardless if it's ocean related or not. Or if it came from me, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> All right, with that, let's, let's go to a couple audience questions. All right, so there's a question here that says, how do you identify various currents? You sort of hinted towards this in some of your comments earlier, the idea of identifying different currents. Sure. So I tend to think of, of, of currents as kind of more of a persistent flow, right? So you have the, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream doesn't stop flowing. It just wiggles around. You just wiggly garden hose scenario. Or you have the Labrador Current, which is a persistent flow. And then you have water masses that are getting moved around that aren't necessarily currents. Um, but the way we do that is, and, there, and this is argued over all the time, is to look at these different water masses is to use, um, you can use salinity and temperature measurements. That's kind of our workhorse. This is what's called a CTD. So we measure the conductivity, which gives us the salinity of the water and the water temperature. And then we've, we have these two things, and then we argue about like, what we really think the water masses that we have. But you can also use dissolved oxygen. Um, Nitrates. Um, some one interesting thing out here that we have that just blows my mind is that there's there's Antarctic water flowing along at the base of the Gulf Stream, and one way to to tell that is is the high silicate content that's in that yeah. water, right? So that's yeah, so not Arctic, but Antarctic. Did water. I say Arctic? I'm sorry. No, yeah. you didn't. I was just I was making I yeah, was right. clarifying that okay, like, the yeah. idea that it's this far north. Antarctic water, yeah, which right. is I, that just fascinates me. Yeah. And I, I do remember that that. You know, the sponges down in Antarctica are glass sponges because the silicates right. are so abundant, right? right? So that's one way to kind of, anyway. Yeah. All right, so same person asks a, a question about how long do you expect to be able to harness this energy resource off our coast? And I think you could sit, I think you could put that in two ways. How long will it be before we maybe begin to harness the energy off our coast, whether it's wave or Gulf Stream? I think the question is towards Gulf Stream, and then how, from that point, maybe, how long do you think we could harness? Yeah, so that, that's a tough, that's a difficult question because, well, for example, in April of 2022, we will harvest, harness right. wave energy to desalinate water at Jeanette's Pier. Right. So that Some of it depends on scale. Quickly, right, yeah, but uh, if you're talking about marine hydrokinetic energy as like a grid scale energy, that's more, that's more of a, a political question almost like what where's the will where's the funding to do that you know do people want that um, and the other thing to keep in mind about marine hydrokinetic energy is when it comes to wind and solar energy they've been around 50 100 years then the technology is much further along than marine hydrokinetic energy so a lot of people say well you know it's not cost efficient to harvest wave energy when you can get solar and wind but that's just because the technology has evolved for so long. We are not there yet. So we're, you know, we could perhaps get cheap marine energy after the technology comes along. Yeah. So along those lines, um, a name that we know here, George Bonner asks, um, what other niche applications for marine energy do you see in North Carolina? So I think uh, We've got, we've got some really interesting aquaculture going on around here. And, and a lot of times energy is needed around those aquaculture farms to monitor the different parameters. For example, oyster aquaculture is going on right now in, in Oregon Inlet. And that's where ener you know, ocean energy could perhaps pr provide some of those observations that are needed for the aquaculture farms. Um, specifically, me, I like to measure things and I need power. And so when I'm done, with my battery pack, I've got to go replace the instrument and put new batteries in it. And so I'd like to have um, energy from the ocean to make measurements longer term. Yeah, and I mean, I guess, you know, <clears throat> I think of a lot of these instruments you use, gliders and other things like that that are battery powered in some aspects or other underwater drones that are battery powered. I mean, creating charging stations around the coast, allowing these things to be out longer is a great opportunity, yeah. probably. Absolutely, and, and one of the projects that I'm working on with my colleagues at NC State is to, to use a, an ocean kite to power an autonomous underwater vehicle. So, you know, right. there's, there's a need right there. Yeah. Um, another question about um, identifying upwelling near the coast, whether you've ever identified upwelling along our coast. Uh-huh. So, um, 
Yes, and, and the, the neat thing about upwelling our, along our coast is because of that Hatteras front aspect of, of dividing those two shelf water masses, uh, folks that live around here know that when it upwells in, say, Nags Head in the summertime, it can be very unpleasant, right? And you, to the point of wanting to put on a full wetsuit to get in the water <laughs> when it's blowing out of southwest for a week. And yet, like down in Emerald Isle, when it upwells, the water there maybe cools a little bit, but it's not like that. That's because it's that water from the south that's being upwelled, not the cold pool water. And you can easily identify those different water masses by taking one of these CTDs like we have and we do this with the students and lowering it into the water and measuring the salinity and temperature. There's a huge salinity difference between those different, well I shouldn't say huge, but there's a, a large enough difference in salinity between those water masses to identify one from the other. So yes. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, a, well, hold on, one more question. <laughs> this is from Ken. What was the scariest situation you have ever been in while researching in the, in the Gulf Stream? Now remember <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> that you should have been in. <laughs> <laughs> this anyway. is from Ken, you said? Uh-huh. Oh, scariest situation. Um, and I think... I think you could also play on that with also what's some of the most interesting things that you've seen while being out on the Gulf Stream. Uh, I don't, I don't know that I've ever been. I've been in the Gulf Stream. I've been in the Gulf Stream before, and it was very rough with you, <laughs> right? And I've been offshore before of Hatteras when when it was blowing um, hurricane speeds. Um, but I don't know that I've ever been in a terribly horrifying situation in the Gulf Stream or working out there. I, I've been wary of the fact that the weather is heavy, but um, you know, the scariest stuff that I experience is either going through Oregon Inlet, which scares <laughs> the hell out of me because I've seen green through the windows with John before and dripping through the roof, um, or I, I actually had, I was working on a buoy off of Moorhead City almost 20 years ago diving. And I, I was working very hard underwater in about 100 feet of water, and I nearly blacked out. That scared me. That <laughs> scared me. But that's why we have good safety measures in place. And, and, and this is why he, you don't have many scary things like this, because we are so safe and experienced at what we do. That's right, Dean Corbett. Thank you. All right, well, I certainly want to take and of this course we also We also have Corey, who's risk averse and keeps us out of trouble. Anyway, Corey's great at making sure that we're doing what we should be doing. He is. And so I want to thank Dr. Mulia, Mike, for taking the time in the hot seat, answering my questions, and giving you the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Mike, one of our scientists, um, and, and giving you that opportunity to learn about some of the expertise that we, have, that we have here at the Coastal Studies Institute. And I encourage you to sort of reach out to our scientists when you have questions. Now you know, when you have questions about the Gulf Stream or other physics related to the ocean, you know, Mike's here to try and answer some of those questions. Maybe don't flood his email just yet. Um, anyway, we appreciate you taking the time to spend your evening with us tonight. Um, we look forward to, to moving forward, trying to do monthly Meet the Scientists as part of this series. And so join us next month on a date that you will soon be told because I'm not sure what it is. Um, and and uh, we look forward to seeing you. So thank you again and uh, have a good evening. It's hot in the hot seat, baby. <laughs> <laughs>